Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the ninth annual Transatlantic Forum on Russia. My name is Heather Conley. I direct our Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program at CSIS, and we are delighted to be in partnership for this particular forum with the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding in Warsaw. Um, if you have missed our first two sessions in this forum, we discussed uh, official U.S. policy and European policy uh, towards Russia as it, as it evolves uh, with major significant uh, events in 2020. Uh, just this week, we had a deep dive into Russia's internal political dynamics with many changes to the Russian constitution, as well as the response and reaction to uh, Russian citizens and civil society to all these changes. So today we come to perhaps one of the most important issues facing Russia's future, and that's its energy future and the future of its external energy markets. And we have a wonderful panel to help us understand this very important picture that will certainly affect the uh, future of Russia's economy as well as its political structures. We at CSIS are so privileged and grateful to have this partnership with the Center for Polish-Russian uh, Dialogue and Understanding and my dear friend, Ernest Wyszykiewicz, who is the director of the center. I'm gonna turn this over to Ernest to tell you very briefly uh, a bit about the center and what it does. And then Ernest will uh, inter uh, introduce our first two speakers. And so we'll get started. Again, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the ninth annual Transatlantic Forum on Russia and Russia's Energy Futures. Ernest, over to you. Thank you, Heather. The pleasure is ours, actually. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be a partner to CSIS for our annual Transatlantic Forum on Russia. I'm very happy that we can do this uh, online despite the circumstances we did it, and I'm really uh, thankful for that. Uh, today, we are going to focus on energy issues. Uh, the Center for Polish-Russian Tech Understanding uh, doesn't deal a lot with energy, but we tr put a lot of our energy to foster dialogue between Poles and Russians and also dialogue about Russia among our Western friends. Uh, so today, energy is uh, on the table. As we all know, the energy landscape is in flux, as it always is. Actually, uh, it applies both markets, oil, gas, renewable, renewables, to political economy of oil and gas. The transition towards decarbonization is moving forward. The trajectory has been set. Challenges are manifold for many actors, be it producers or, or consumers of energy, exporters, importers, coal-dominated countries like my own Poland or uh, uh, like Russia. So today, by definition, we take Russia as a main point of reference because of the title of our, of our conversation. So, uh, but we don't want to leave uh, the big picture aside as well. So we have excellent guests. And let me first introduce uh, to you Vladimir Milov. Uh, renowned long-time Russian energy expert, once upon a time the Deputy Energy Minister of Russian Federation, after that uh, uh, head of Institute of Energy Policy, now Chief Economic Advisor to Alexei Navalny, an excellent YouTuber actually, so if you want to know more about Russian economy and also international politics, just I can only recommend you to, to follow him on YouTube. Uh, so Vladimir, uh, a quick question and very obvious one. Russia has has been flexing its energy muscle many times in recent years, be it Nord Stream 2 and other issues. But at the same time, Russia uh, seems to be lagging behind in energy transition. So uh, uh, the, the world is rapidly moving forward uh, when it comes to decarbonization, while Russia, at least when I look at recent Russian energy strategy to 2035, seems to be clinging desperately still to hydrocarbons uh, and treating climate change sometimes as a bogus, sometimes as a, uh, as a chance. Uh, is there a way out of this conundrum? I mean, what is the strategy here? What is the energy policy and what is the energy politics maybe that drives currently Russia in this domain? Please, the floor is yours. 
uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, to be here. And um, uh, I, I don't think that Russia is even lagging behind in terms of energy transition. I think if you look at the numbers, it's actually very clearly absent uh, at the global stage. Now, this year, uh, when BP has published its statistical review of world energy in June, we saw that in a global primary energy mix, renewables have passed a 5% threshold. They are bigger right now as a share of global energy mix than nuclear, for instance. Uh, but in Russia, it's uh, zero something fraction of a percent. We still have renewable projects are, in Russia are extremely limited to very small ones of experimental nature. And uh, the dynamics uh, in the past couple of decades have virtually been non-existent. I used to chair an interministerial working group uh, on energy strategy 2020 back in 2002 when I used to work in the Russian government. And even back then, there was some talk that we need to move to green energy and renewables. And uh, there were some expectations that by now, we, we are right now at the end of 2020, uh, renewables will at least play some part. At the moment, they are playing zero part. And if you take a look at the portfolio of projects that Russia has, it's like uh, totally limited to some experimental stuff. This is what you also read in the official documents. There is no even, not even a mention of scale uh, of a serious effort to uh, move uh, in terms of domestic energy market to move towards uh, switching to renewable uh, energy in, in power and heating and uh, elsewhere. Uh, so th there's, I mean, this subject is mentioned for the purpose of politeness, I understand, and uh, this is how it always used to be. But uh, 20 years on, we still this, uh, have this heavily hydrocarbon dominated mentality, which is not a surprise because our policy making is very much dominated by the hydrocarbon lobby, which are the biggest players in the Russia's economy, uh, the biggest wallets of Putin and his inner circle. These financial flows and managing them are actually something that Putin and uh, the government are most busy with uh, most of the time. So why would they bother about renewables when you have this lucrative hydrocarbon cash flow, even at relatively uh, low prices? So uh, essentially, under this modality of thinking, uh, and under Vladimir Putin, because there's great policy inertia, uh, under his rule. I don't think anything's going to change in the foreseeable future. They will continue to politely mention uh, energy transition and renewable energy, but uh, nothing practical will be done. Under Putin, everything will still be dominated by hydrocarbons. Climate change, I think, is, is even a more uh, distant goal because even the top leadership in Russia has been extremely skeptical uh, about the whole the whole idea that uh, climate change is man-made and that we can or should do anything about it. Uh, Russia's practical policy approach on climate was always sticking to the same principle of uh, comparing the present uh, CO2 emissions to the levels of late Soviet Union, essentially in 1990. And, you know, like, you know, we are a country where our favorite sports is building Potemkin villages. <laughs> So on paper, yeah, we did reduce emissions a lot as compared to 1990. But recently, Putin has signed a decree with a very telling number, 666, uh, about achieving climate change goals, where essentially, if you look at the, the, the practical issues in there, uh, Putin is allowing Russian uh, industries to actually increase CO2 emissions because uh, the, the comparison level is still that same 1990, which is totally irrelevant for uh, what is practically going on on the ground today. And, and Putin has been skeptical many times about the very uh, scientific fact that uh, climate change is being influenced by human activity. So uh, what do you expect? A fun fact, uh, uh, I have been approached uh, some time ago by certain North American companies who actually do the services for uh, US oil and gas producers and uh, transporting companies uh, measuring methane leaks from upstream fields or pipelines. And they got some good contracts out there in the United States and Canada. So they approached me, can I possibly help them with uh, uh, arranging some sort of a contracts measuring methane leaks for say Rosneft or Gazprom? So, 
I tried to talk to some people who said that we are totally not interested. This doesn't, we don't care how much methane we emit. It's not our business. So this is, I mean, it's very illustrative, very telling about the, the real policy approach in Russia uh, in terms of climate. So yeah, uh, it's all like 20 years ago, it's extremely hydrocarbon dominated, uh, essentially overlooking the fact that we are on the brink of a, a great demand revolution in the global energy. Uh, a year ago, and uh, I can send you a link if you'd like, I wrote a big piece in English for Latvian Center for Eastern European Policy Studies, arguing that Russia is not ready for another 1980s style oil price shock, which is coming because of a, a switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy, plus greater competition at the oil and gas markets. It was written before the price collapse this spring, but essentially the problem is still out there they still try to figure out how much the they profits they can earn from oil and gas exports, even under lower prices. But I don't see any switch to thinking beyond that. And what we're gonna do when like major developed economies will uh, forbid uh, internal combustion engines uh, and transport and switch to electric vehicles and so on. And uh, this year we have started to hear from big industry players like Shell or BP that we might have already passed a peak of oil demand in 2019 and the combination of the COVID uh, crisis plus transfer to renewable energy and transport might never bring oil demand uh, to the level that we saw last year. I don't see any political readiness for the reasons I just explained. These folks are basically busy counting the oil and gas uh, export revenue. Uh, it's uh, such an interesting thing that it's actually very, very difficult to switch your mind to something else and to major trends that might shape a different future. Thank you, Vladimir, for your insight. Uh, so now let's move to the field that where Russia is actually present, uh, natural gas. And let me turn over to our um, second excellent speaker, Anna Mikulska. Uh, she's a senior fellow at Kleinman Center for Energy Policy at Pennsylvania University non-resident fellow, Center for Energy Studies, Rice University, Baker Institute for Public Policy. Uh, her research focuses on geopolitics of natural gas within the EU, so for, uh, former Soviet uh, bloc, and Russia. Uh, so geopolitics of natural gas, a catchy phrase, especially in the context of Nord Stream 2 and many other recent events. Uh, but let's just look from the broader picture, actually, perspective. Uh, uh, when it comes to Russian gas policy, both domestic and external, uh, in the context of the evolution of international gas markets, in the context of EU energy and gas policy, uh, LNG market, how do you see Russia's role in all of these areas, actually, in the context also of uh, transatlantic uh, relations? Please, Anna, the floor is yours. So quickly, in three or four minutes, let me do that. <laughs> well... Russia is one of the top, obviously, uh, uh, gas producers, and a lot of that gas uh, in the world, and a lot of that gas is used domestically. Um, slightly less is exported, uh, but those exports play a very important role for Russia. Um, domestically, the gas prices used to be very much subsidized. The prices nowadays have grown a little bit, but still Gazprom, which is the main company in Russia that actually owns the entire transmission system, gas transmission system, and most of the resources, uh, Gazprom is seen kind of as this last resort uh, place where Russian companies, Russian uh, gas um, uh, customers can always get gas even if they don't pay sometimes. And that's where, uh, where often gas, uh, Gazprom actually loses money. Um, on the other hand, Gazprom has been given monopoly over exports, um, and that's where Gazprom used to at least make money. Um, it um, major export market, it's Europe. Um, and until very recently, those exports were everything. And um, very recently, that has changed where Gazprom has to share export monopoly um, in terms of LNG. So LNG nowadays is allowed to be um, exported by Novatec. I think Rosneft has also been allowed, but Rosneft hasn't gotten the, the technology up and hasn't been uh, actually producing LNG. But Nes uh, Novatec has and has been very successful at that. Still, pipeline exports within only gas from uh, gas from monopoly, and its major uh, ma major export market is Europe. 
Um, and it's very interesting because this, this European market is um, divided in two parts. And the one part is Western Europe, where Russia has been doing business since 1970s, kind of really business as usual, typical economic relations. Um, and then we go to back to Central and Eastern Europe, Southeast Europe, where Russia has been very much a dominant player uh, and has used its dominance uh, to both um, exert economic benefits uh, in that it actually priced its gas higher than it would price its gas, for example, for Germany or Italy. But that's kind of normal. If you have that ability, you will use that for your advantage, right? But Russia has also used this gas to geopolitical uh, for geopolitical purposes, has pushed countries to do policy-wise what it wants, um, many times, particularly in Ukraine, uh, where it didn't like the, the way that Ukraine has been uh, increasingly associated with EU. You saw those pushes against those uh, uh, those moves, whether association of Ukraine with EU or NATO, um, and you, you ended up with breaks in gas supply, um, and, and the different explanations on both parts. And we can go into this, um, that's a very long story. We can go into this in detail if there's specifically any questions. Um, so now the West part of Europe sees really Russia kind of as this typical economic actor in terms of gas and, and the gas relations as really kind of trade, typical trade relations. Um, and Central and Eastern Europe sees it as geo, ge, geoeconomic or geopolitical tool. Um, and that's why you see this very much pushback in Central and Eastern Europe against Russia's news, uh, new uh, investment in pipelines to Europe. And that will be Nord Stream 2. And a lot of people probably have heard about it. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, talk about this for many, many reasons, but particularly because there has been a strong opposition in Poland, in the Baltic republics, um, in Ukraine, uh, other countries in Central Eastern Europe, slightly less so or less visibly so. Uh, whereas uh, Western Europe has been kind of much more, well, let's see, maybe this actually can help us bring more demand and so on. Well, we have to also understand that the ability of Western Europe to treat Russia like a regular supplier depends on the fact that the market is very much diversified and very much interconnected. So you can balance this market and if for any reasons, um, Russian gas doesn't come. The European, Western European countries can usually supply the, 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 the uh, provide the provide the supply that's needed in most cases, at the very least. Um, in Eastern Central Europe, that hasn't been so. You see those when you look at the pipeline map. You see really kind of really ma uh, pipelines going in one direction, not interconnected, and hence really dependent on Russia. Now, North, going back to those two pipelines um, really quickly, Nord Stream 2 particularly has br brought a lot of attention for several reasons. Well, first of all, there is the, there has been the push for Nord Stream 2 to uh, comply with, um, with liberalization package, with the third energy package by the EU, which makes it difficult for Gazprom to own the pipelines and own the gas and sell the gas that's in, uh, in that pipeline that goes directly from Russia to Germany. And second of all, well, and that's kind of really right going on right now, is the sanctions that US has imposed on Nord Stream 2. Uh, one set of sanctions has become effective in December of last year. And we actually had seen um, the uh, pipeline line vessels company who, who provided them backing out and the pipeline being basically stopped for, for one year now. Um, and Russia struggling to bring in its own ships to complete the pipeline. At this moment, we actually have them moving towards completion. Uh, Germany allowed for, uh, I think, uh, provided the permits for uh, laying around two or three kilometers of that pipeline. Well, still around 150 remain. So that's, uh, and that's in Danish waters, um, a lot of that. Uh, but, but, Germ uh, but US also has just um, uh, put out the Defense Act which includes provisions for sanctions on any company that helps Nord Stream 2. And that would include approximately 150 companies in the US. That's huge or related to the, doing business in the US. Um, that's a huge issue um, for those companies and not only for, 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 uh, for, uh, for Gazprom, of course. Um, because um, it's, and, and generally in Europe, and again, we actually see the division where, where Western Europe, especially Germany, who see, which sees actually quite a lot of benefit uh, bringing in more, ga more gas from Russia to, 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 to its border, 
um, we see that very much support uh, for the pipeline. EU kind of looking at the sanctions very, uh, you know, very, very carefully, trying to see what is this a problem with international law and so on, and, and uh, is, is, is US kind of imposing um, on their, uh, their rights to set up their own, uh, their, their own market. Um, countries in Central and Eastern Europe are being for those sanctions. But I think there is there is this there is this middle ground there, and we can go into the, into this um, in more detail because I think it's very interesting um, to see the the, the 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 small pieces that come together. But also, I think there is a big uh, opportunity for the new administration um, to use the setup uh, to actually create a better dialogue between Central Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and the US, um, and provide a, a much more diversified market, um, uh, increasingly uh, uh, increasingly independent uh, and less dependent on, on Russia in that way. Um, also, to some extent, uh, the way that sanctions are set up that could be actually exploited. So I'll stop at this. I know there's probably going to be a lot um, uh, discussion, and uh, I'd like to take you know take time to to do that. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right. Nord Stream Two is such an important part of the conversation, particularly as you noted the uh, the recent uh, passing of the National Defense Authorization Act and, and additional sanctions. Well, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, bring in our third panelist, our very own uh, Nico Safus, who is the Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the CSIS Energy Security and Climate Change Program. Um, before joining CSIS, Nikos uh, led uh, PFC Energy, which is now IHS Markets, uh, Global Gas Consulting Practice. And uh, he spent uh, many years as a commercial advisor, actually to the Alaskan State Legislature, focusing on Alaskan energy resources. And of course, Alaska, uh, which uh, allows the United States to be an Arctic nation. Nicholas and I have been uh, doing a lot of work thinking about Russia's energy futures, particularly in the Arctic. And so Nikos, I'd, I'd love to turn to you. Thank you for being with us and, and help us understand uh, the importance of the Arctic to Russia's energy future. And then I'd like you to swing uh, a little bit towards um, something that Vladimir were telling us about the European Union and the new Green Deal and Russia's most important energy export market is really transforming how it views uh, uh, climate and energy, carbon border adjustment taxes, but there's a whole suite of issues. We'd love your comments on that. And before I turn to you, just a note to our audience, we want to bring your questions into this conversation. So there is a, a button uh, on the, the web, the event page, go ahead and click that, send us your questions. We wanna bring you into the conversation. So Nikos, uh, over to you, we'd love your thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Heather, for, for having me uh, participate in this great conversation. Um, let me begin from the Arctic. And I think there's three stories to tell about the Arctic. One is the rise and fall of oil. So this is a story that really begins around 2010. Before that, if you look at Rosneft's annual report, the word Arctic shows up about like five times, it's incidental. Then suddenly get, Rosneft gets a bunch of licenses. In 2011 and 12, it signs a number of agreements, with BP, ExxonMobil, ENI, Stat Oil. And so there's a flurry of activity to try to move to this new frontier for oil exploration for Russia. And then you have the pivotal year of 2014, where two things happen. You have the events in Ukraine and the startup of sanctions against Russia, and sort of the first big export event between ExxonMobil and Rosneft, where there's a discovery made um, just as the sanctions are ramping up. Uh, and so you have this moment where energy and geopolitics sort of meet, and I think if you fast forward to the present, you realize that that inflection point was really the moment where the ambition sort of fizzled out. Over time, companies essentially pulled out in part because of sanctions, in part because the lower price environment made exploration and development much less economical. And so now if you go and look, there isn't really much happening. Yes, there's a couple of projects, Gazprom F has a project, but really that focus, that aspiration that existed four, five, six, seven years ago, that is gone when it comes to oil. Gas is a different story. And so the second story I want to talk about is a story of survival and relevance. And this is really about Gazprom. 
Now, Gazprom has always been an Arctic company. When you think about the development of the Soviet hydrocarbon and Soviet gas industry, it's always been from big fields near or north of the Arctic Circle. So the Arctic is not a new frontier for Gazprom. But Gazprom is going to the Arctic because it has to go to the Arctic. It needs to develop fields further and further north in order to survive. Gazprom has always been dependent on a number of very large fields that have been producing for a long time and are now in decline. And so when you see Gazprom going and developing big fields like Kovanenko, which is one of its major fields in the Yamal Peninsula, it's really doing that because if it doesn't do that, it won't be able to keep its production at the sustainable level and to maintain exports to Europe. So really for Gazprom, this is a matter of survival. The third Arctic story is really about Novatech and LNG. And this is our story. You know, Novatech is a private company, whatever that means in the context of Russia. Um, and sort of out of nowhere, they developed an LNG business in the Yamal Peninsula. They started up the Yamal LNG project. They did so at a time when sanctions was imposed on it. Um, after that, they developed and have started construction of a second project, the Arctic 2 LNG project. Uh, they also have a third project, which is somewhat confusingly called Arctic 1, uh, and they have a smaller project. And so this is really a remarkable story where a company, not really out of nowhere, but sort of out of nowhere for global standards, comes and develops this massive business. Uh, it's helped by the Russian state. There are very generous tax breaks. The Russian Federation picks up the tab for icebreakers, for security and all that. But this is really, if you think about Gazprom's Arctic strategy, is sort of an inward strategy. It's about pulling gas into the old market. Novatec is an outward strategy. It's really about developing LNG, reaching new markets, but also creating activity and traffic in the Arctic. This is really about developing. We have, I think they have about 15 uh, icebreakers in LNG. They're trying to develop transshipment uh, facilities on both the East and West. So this is really a footprint from which you develop economic activity and a bigger presence in the Arctic. So this to me is sort of the three different stories when you think about Russia and the Arctic. Oil, you know, the moment has sort of passed. Pipeline gas, it's necessary for the survival of Gazprom. LNG, it's really about Novatec and reaching new markets and entering into a new business. So that is on the Arctic side. Let me then say a few things about Europe and the European Green Deal. I think the first thing is to appreciate just how much the conversation in Europe has changed. Uh, I've been struck. Uh, this has been uh, a couple of these past few months have been actually pivotal in the history of European energy security with the startup of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, the launch, the commissioning of a new facility in Croatia. Um, and what is remarkable is that no one is really talking about, I mean, some people are, uh, I am, um, but it's really, you know, the market and the world has really changed. Uh, and I think that is a context in which to think about some of these energy security conversations, and if you look around the world, and we in, our, in the Energy Security and Climate Change Program, we spend a lot of time thinking about what countries are doing on climate around the world. And no one is being more ambitious than the European Union. And no one is putting more money on the table to make the transition happen than the European Union, right? And so this traditional market that has historically accounted for most of Russia's hydrocarbons and until recently, all of its pipeline gas. Um, this is a market that's changing. But I think we have to think about that change in a complicated way, because we know that by 2050, Europe shouldn't be consuming much natural gas. But we have no idea what happens between now and 2050. There's a lot of uncertainty. And there's a lot of difference in opinion, especially between Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe, about the pathway that gas should follow from now until then. We also know that gas could be caught up in disputes, whether that is about methane or carbon border adjustment. If you think of those things, the two things are separate. And so we know that in 2050, there's gonna be a diminished role, but the pathway from here to there could be quite rocky. Having said that, I do wanna close with two thoughts on Europe. One, we know that in a shrinking market, uh, 
Russia is probably still going to play an important role, right? I mean, I don't want to venture this forecast quite very quite so vividly, but it's quite possible that the last molecule of gas consumed in Europe is going to come from Russia. <laughs> that the last supplier standing in Russia in, in Europe is probably going to be Russia. But the relationship is going to be different. It's going to be a shrinking market. It's, the price are probably not going to be as high as they've been. The geopolitical salience of that relationship is, will have changed dramatically as Europe's energy market changes. And so there will still be an economic relationship, perhaps, probably never as lucrative as it was before, but all the atmospherics around it will have changed. And I think the last question, the last really big unknown, is whether or not the self-interest of Russia uh, is going to lead to an investment in new solutions, right? I mean, there are people that are half jokingly saying we should turn Nord Stream 2 into a hydrogen pipeline. Um, but I think that real question of if the European energy system is going to change, is Russia going to just try to defend whatever market share it can retain in oil and gas and even coal and let the market go away? Or is it going to try to find a way to participate in this energy transition and say, you need hydrogen, you need methanol, you need ammonia, you need things that we can provide. Um, as Mr. Milo said, the, that process is not moving very fast in Russia, but the opportunity is there, right? The opportunity is there for Russia to be a partner, even in a different energy market. So we'll have to see how that plays out. And I'll stop there. Because thank you so very much. I absolutely was struck by, in some ways, the bookends of your remarks. Vladimir was talking about the inertia in Russia, and all we've been talking about is the change that's going to be, the, the profound change is happening in the market. So uh, thank you so much. We're getting great audience questions. I want I want you to encourage to, to give us those questions. And as you can understand, Nord Stream 2 is one of those issues that is foremost in our audience mind. So I want to do two things. I want to each ask each of our panelists one question on Nord Stream and then, and then my own question here. So very rapidly, um, do you believe Nord Stream 2 will be completed? That's a yes or no question. And then uh, if, it's an, if it's completed, how important is it to uh, gas exports to Europe? So that's my sort of Nord Stream 2 question, uh, questions from our audience. My question uh, is about new markets and Russia seeking new energy markets. And that, of course, is China and Asia. And Nikos, it's bringing your conversation in part what makes Arctic LNG so important is that it gives the flexibility of shipping east and west. And of course, after a decade long negotiation, the power of Siberia piping uh, energy to China. But has Russia missed the Asian market? China too has diversified its energy. Where does it go if China will buy some, and China is a participant in the Arctic LNG uh, projects as well, the, the Yamal projects, but is it enough? So Vladimir, let me start with you. I want rapid answers on Nord Stream 2 and then tell us about uh, how Russia uh, can reorient its uh, external energy markets to Asia. Uh, thank you. Well, Nord Stream, yes, I think physically it's a yes, it will be completed. We're not talking about the quality here because Russia didn't have experience previously on laying pipes uh, subsea. So there might be issues uh, further down the road, but I think physically it will be completed. I also wonder why I understand that everybody likes to thrill themselves with discussing the geopolitics of Nord Stream 2, but from the energy standpoint, uh, this project hardly matters because we already have excessive surplus capacity of supplying gas uh, to Europe, exceeding all the imaginary uh, demand expectations. So we're just going to add up some surplus capacity. Now, what impact that will have, I don't know. Only for a tug of war between Russia and Ukraine, probably, but influence on the energy market as such, I think, will be neg negligible. And on the Asian markets, it's, it's pretty clear. A power of Siberia has once again demonstrated that if you want to reach the Asian markets, you go LNG. You don't build these lengthy, overly costly pipelines. Essentially, let me be absolutely frank with you. At this moment, power of Siberia is generating extremely heavy financial losses for Gazprom. Because even uh, after zeroing out all the taxation uh, and all the tax exemptions for this project, they still need about like $350, $400 uh, dollars per thousand cubic meters price. 
to at least zero out the costs and to balance the project. The price for third quarter was 114. Uh, so you can see how much down in negative territory they are, which means that we come back to square one. We need to develop LNG projects and Gazprom has been extremely slow and lazy at that, as uh, been correctly mentioned by colleagues. The only projects that we have and uh, that are realistically uh, coming next on the horizon are done by private companies, maybe not necessarily 100% private, but still they are not intruded by the government to that extent. Uh, this is done by a private initiative. Uh, Sakhalin 2 was also done by Shell and the Japanese before Gazprom took it over. So essentially it's also a private and foreign driven project. Now these projects are essentially focused on Asian markets and that demonstrates that here's a clear link. Uh, there is a possibility for our commercially viable supplies of Russian gas to Asian market, but only through development of LNG. So as long as this pattern uh, continues, we will increase our presence there. Once again, I have to say, the one thing which should not have been mentioned uh, about the projects of Novatech, they also feature uh, extremely heavy tax exemptions. So Russian budget system essentially gets nothing from all this massive production of LNG and selling it to uh, China and other uh, Asian consumers. That's an important factor that we should uh, also bear in mind that all this massive intrusion onto Asian market uh, doesn't mean that the government gets anything, the country gets anything from that. It's only for the profit of those who carry out their projects, but in terms of real influence and benefits for the Russian Federation as such, uh, the influence is near zero. Wow, that's a really important point to, to reinforce. Thank you, Vladimir. Anna. So yeah, I, I think the, similarly to Vladimir, I think um, Nord Stream 2 is going to be completed, if not for the fact that Russia will want to show that they can. <laughs> and um, the fact that there are Russian uh, American sanctions, I think it additionally motivates Putin and Gazprom to do that. Um, and, um, you know, it's going to be completed as Vladimir was saying, because of the diversification of the market um, that has progressed um, in Central and Eastern Europe, in Southeast Europe, it's going to be not as important as it would be otherwise. However, it is important though that the projects that are undertaken currently that are still not finished are actually finished and completed and the gas flows. So, and that's where I'm talking about Baltic pipe. That's where I'm talking about additional LNG terminals. Uh, that's where I'm talking about the different interconnections, um, particularly between, uh, between um, the, the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries and Poland and Ukraine, um, reverse flows uh, between Ukraine, Bulgaria, you know, between the Southeast, in, in the Southeast Europe, um, same, same thing goes for Hungary. This all needs to be completed. If not, or if Nord Stream 2 would actually prevent completion of that, because it would seem at least economically not, 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 not feasible or not, uh, that could become a problem where you will end up with actually dominance of Russian gas. Um, and uh, and uh, again, through the German connection this time. Um, Germany, I think, is in a diff slightly different situation just because it's Russia's largest cost customer. It's, its demand is huge, so it kind of has a, a little bit of a bargain, more bargaining, uh, um, bargaining uh, hand here. But again, relying only increasingly, at least, on Russian gas, um, lack of terminals, LNG terminals uh, still there could impact this country ability to to, to prevent some of the uh, Russian meddling that has been um, uh, has been uh, present uh, in um, in Europe. So that's uh, that. The interesting part with with, and I completely agree with Vladimir on uh, power of Siberia. Um, that pipeline has not been. It seems at least that the pipeline hasn't been built for profit. Um, I think Gazprom, as it was uh, building it, it it's and, 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 and there has been several voices saying that this is almost like a gift to the Chinese um, government, so they could build additional pipelines. Um, and that would particularly be that power of Siberia too, that would actually reach to the Western Siberia fields that also feed Europe, and in that allow Russia an arbitrage. Um, so it's almost like a diversification, you know, in Europe you have diversification away from Russia, and Russia is thinking about about diversification away from Europe. But also this allow, allowing for arbitrage creates additional geopolitical uh, strength on the part, on part of Russia. Of course, again, 
if there is enough of a diversified liberalized market liquid market where you have a lot of uh, in europe when you have ability to access gas not only by some countries and i think this is important to say not only by some countries there are some countries that are for example landlocked like hungary that do not have direct access to uh, to lng um or or and um, that have uh, you know issues with romania and inability of romania to uh, to to lie in enough pipeline to to bring in um, additional supplies from non-russian supply well those countries you know when you think about it they would they could be still relying and highly relying on russia and we see this actually uh, hungary has recently um been in talks with russia on uh, signing up contract to to deliver ga Russian gas um, through Turkish stream. Um, the interesting part is though, because of this increasing liberalization market growing, this is a very different contract. And I think that's another thing that we need to underscore. The contracts that currently, uh, you know, that there's a lot of long-term contracts that are expiring in 2020s. Some of them already expired, some are about to expire. And the new contracts that Gazprom is signing are very different very much much more flexible take or pay is different uh, the flexibility increases and that has been actually has shown very vividly in 2020 in the reduction of russian gas coming via pipeline um, because what happened is a lot of countries that already signed had those very flexible conditions with with Gazprom, but also with, uh, with, with other supplies through, through pipeline, they actually were able to defer some of those uh, gas and a lot of this has been gas from its gas. Um, in the meantime, you had a lot of LNG coming, including Novatex LNG. Uh, so um, I think it's, it's, it's very important. And I think that domestically, the inter it, there's an interesting also relation between Gazprom and Novatex that could be explored. Thank you. Anna, thank you so much. Great points. Nikos, walk us through where your reflections are in Nord Stream 2, but uh, also the Asian market, which I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about as well. Well, we're, we're going to make it three out of three. I also believe that Nord Stream 2 is going to be completed. And I also agree with Vladimir. I don't think this project really matters. Uh, I am constantly baffled by how much people want to talk about this project. I think it's a largely inconsequential project. Um, I think the market has changed. I think even if you look at Nord Stream 1, a lot of the things that were that are now talked about that Nord Stream 2 is going to do, Nord Stream 1 was supposed to do, it didn't really do those things. So I, uh, you know, if you really press me and I put on my consultant market analyst hat, I can maybe tell you that it's going to matter for how Slovakia gets its gas in about like 10 years, depending of if there's a new route, but I, I don't think this project really matters that much. Um, let me talk about Asia. Um, I think there is, our starting point has to be geology. Look, the geology is such that Russia doesn't have as much hydrocarbons, as much gas in the East as it does in West Siberia, right? So it's not gonna be a big supplier to Asia as it has been to Europe because it doesn't have the resource to do that. That I think is has to be our starting point. And the efforts to connect the West Siberia fields that Anna talked about, I mean, that has been a long-term project for Gazprom. Uh, it's not something that I think the Chinese really want to do. They have a lot of gas there. That's not where they need the gas. That's why the project hasn't really gone very far. Number two on Power Siberia, uh, both speakers have mentioned this and I totally agree. Uh, I mean, basically this project happened because China has all the market leverage. Russia can only develop this project by sending the gas to China. And so you have a contract that reflects that reality, right? So and you, you had the project happen when Russia accepted this fact after 2014. Um, there is potential for LNG, uh, but frankly, uh, there has been potential for LNG for a long time and the Russian companies can't really pull it off. Uh, Sakhalin 1, you know, you can go back 10, 15 years and talk about Rosneft trying to sell gas via pipeline, via LNG, there's Sakhalin 3. Um, it just hasn't really happened, which is one reason I think the, the Russian Federation has been quite keen to give all these tax breaks to Novotech, uh, not just because it's the Arctic, but because they can deliver LNG. And none of the other two big uh, state-owned companies have been able to really deliver LNG in that part of the world. But the final thing is um, the LNG market is super, super competitive. Um, you know, there was a time maybe that if you said, oh, I have gas in um, East Siberia, you know, people would get excited. There's a ton of gas out there. There's a ton of projects in North America. There's projects in Southeast Asia. 
uh, Australia, uh, in East Africa, uh, Qatar is, is stepping back in the game. Uh, you're even competing with the Yamal Peninsula um, on the northern side in terms of the resource on the east of Russia. So it's a very difficult market to break into. So uh, it's hard uh, for me to see a scenario where uh, Russia in the east makes a big splash to supply Asian market. I think what you're going to see is uh, a little bit more development in the Arctic. But I think even the Russians and the companies understand that you have about five to 10 years to develop new LNG. After that, the window for development is going to be much, much narrower. Thank you all. It was an excellent conversation. Thank you for your input. Um, a lot of uh, quite controversial messages, I would say, even in my own country. Uh, well, the one that Russia is absent in the climate change debate is okay, we all understand it, but the question that most Stream 2 doesn't matter, that's really something. Uh, and, and, and I uh, we don't have, I would like to comment on it, but we don't have time. Uh, Asia is on the right, we know that actually, thank you for all this, uh, this nice point about the, the role of Asia for Russia and for Europe and for general energy markets. When it comes to Nord Stream 2, let me just finish with my own impression that uh, a long time ago, it stopped to be an energy project. It's not about gas flows, it's about money flows, it's about corruption flows, it's about policy flows. And, and that's why probably this uh, comments from energy business and energy experts are quite different than those coming from, from uh, political uh, uh, experts. So but that's, that's very interesting to hear that. Uh, Thank you all. It was an excellent time for us. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Sayed, for this uh, our third conversation. Um, it was a pleasure for for me, for my center, to host you all of you. And and let me invite you to our last debate that will happen in January. Well, but just follow all of us, both CSIS and the center. You will know soon when it's to come. So thank you once again and.